happy Sabbath. I'm glad to be here today. Um, I'd like to thank um, the health committee for inviting me to do the health nugget for today. And as no, I'm no rock star, okay? <laughs> a lot different, <laughs> a lot different. Um, so uh, my talk today is about exercise as stress rel relief. We know that there is no such thing really as a stress-free life. We all live under certain stresses, certain problems, certain traumas, and obviously as, as we um, are in present day, we know that the world is in um, a great amount of stresses. Um, actually, I, I can't, can't read my own um, PowerPoint. So it says, um, in March 11th, 2022, we reached the two year anniversary of the beginning or where the World Health Association um, announced the pandemic um, in the world. So we're, we've been living under that um, pallor for the last two years at least, and obviously now we're into June. Um, some of the, um, I was talking yesterday with some of the people from the nutrition aspect and the eating disorders, even through this whole stress process, have actually escalated um, across Michigan and actually across the university to a point where they're considering that um, a major problem that we're going into. So how, stress is actually well embedded into our lives nowadays. As you can see, um, this is from the American um, Psychiatric Association and they did a stress survey. And right now people are looking at the um, higher prices due to inflation, uh, the supply chain issues, uh, the global uncertainty, potential retaliation from Russia, um, and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. These are all on people's minds, among other things, obviously among COVID. So we're in a very stressful, stressful situation. Fortunately, there are simple steps to relieve stress. Many of those steps can help improve our health. Um, and so I'm here to just briefly talk about some of those things that we can do to help in, in improve our health. How does exercise help with stress? Physical, physical activity um, improves your body's ability to use oxygen and also improves, improves blood flow. Blood, blood flow, flow, flow to the brain obviously is a, um, a normative that actually calms the brain down, that actually helps the brain function more, and therefore that helps with stress. Exercise also increases your brain's production of endorphins. And we know endorphins are those little magical things that make us feel good. You know, those things that when we're exercising, we get that runner's high. I've never had it myself, but um, again, I've never, <laughs> I don't run. I always tell people, if you see me running, call the police because there's someone chasing me. Physical activity can also take your mind off, mind off your worries. So just doing something, the aspect of concentrating on moving that, that barbell up, um, walking at, up that hill, doing those hundred steps, that can take your mind off the stresses that, your life, they, that are in your life. Also, by concentrating on the rhythm, and, rhythm of your movements, um, it's almost like meditation. Um, you're, you know, as you're feeling, as you're, you're, you're doing those reps, um, that's kind of a meditation that actually will help solve some of your stresses. The American um, hardest, excuse me for a second. And then focusing on uh, physical tasks can prove a sen sense of energy um, and production. You've done something, you're satisfied, you, you, you've gotten something that you've wanted done and there's an inner sense that you've accomplished something, also reducing stresses. The American Health Heart Association um, recommends getting at least 150 minutes activity a week. Um, and so they're saying 30 minutes a day, but it doesn't always have to be a straight 30. It can sometimes be 10, three tens in the day. Just kind of getting into the exercise and, and getting out. We all don't have sometimes 30 minutes, and we definitely don't have 150 minutes um, to do our activities, but if we can sometimes fit 
10 minutes in, whether it's, you know, walking to the corner, um, whether it's um, uh, doing deep knee bends, but getting some 10 minutes in three times a day um, can help to that 150 minutes uh, a week. What type of exercises help with stress? We know that you don't need to be a marathon runner, okay? You don't need to be an elite athlete. Some of the exercises can be very, very simple. Consider trying moderate aerobic exercises such as biking, brisk walking or jogging, swimming or doing water aerobics, playing tennis or racquetball, Zumba or rowing. I tried Zumba one time. I'm, just not good at it, you know, but some of you might be, you know, that whole coordination thing actually isn't my forte, but it's one of those things that some people can really get um, energized with, and so I would look at, you know, if you can find a class um, in, in uh, doing Zumba. Any type of en en exercise can increase your fitness and decrease your stress. We know that 53% of teens say that exercise reduces their stress, much, o much greater than the 30% who said that it was playing video games. So we know that that actually um, helps in their sort of um, working through their stresses. We also know that 68% of them um, see that, you know, that exercise is as a very valid source um, of stress relief. Even sim something simple as gardening or choosing to take, take, uh, take the stairs rather than the elevator can give you an emotional lift. Um, I enjoy gardening, um, or I did enjoy gardening, um, until the raccoons beat me out of it. Um, I know Zach does gardening, you know, that was the one summer when COVID first started, I put in an extensive garden, um, you know, so I had potatoes, onions, uh, you name it, I had it. But just going out in the back of the yard at the end of the night to water, to weed, um, just really helped me um, work through the whole COVID situation and the stresses that that brought about. First, though, in all this, check with your doctor. Your doctor knows, what, supposedly knows your health and your health um, category. So he can direct you to the exercises that you should start with. And obviously, what we need to do is get engaged. So this is the ready, set, go phase. We need to get out there, we need to just do it, and we need to get out over that initial hump. And once we can make it a habit for at least a couple of weeks, it will actually be embedded in you. So. Um, my five minutes are up, and I've probably gone over those, but thank you for having me here today.
Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord, everyone. Amen. Amen. God is good, isn't he? He's good all the time. And it's such a blessing to be in the house of the Lord. Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud symbols. Praise him with clashing symbols. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Please rise for the opening hymn. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in Yeah. 
And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so of God, oh, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God, oh, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Let's give God the glory, every Amen. everybody. Amen. 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 Thank you. Hallelujah. We give you the honor. Amen, church. Amen. So now we're going to move on to our new theme song for the month of June, which is Victory in Jesus. Have you ever felt down? Have you ever felt hopeless? There's good news. Jesus is the victory. Amen. Fresh. 
this time for prayer. We're going to talk to God individually and as a collective group. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. He's working on our hearts today. Some of us are wearing masks and some are not. But we all are here to talk to God. Amen? Amen. So when we're singing, we're inviting you to come down. Or if you want to stay in your seats, that's okay as well. Just as long you lift up the name of God in prayer according to what you want to say to him. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. who can come to the front as we pray. Those of us feel comfortable kneeling where you are, we all kneel for prayer. O oh God, O oh Heavenly Father, it is with grateful heart that we have come into your tabernacle this morning to give you thanks and praise for your goodness, for your mercy, for your love and your compassion towards sinful human beings. We recognize that if it wasn't for your shed blood and Calvary cross, none of us would be alive today in your sanctuary to lift up your name, to magnify, to exalt your high and holy name. What a privilege to sinful human being. This morning we recognize our unworthiness. We recognize that Without you, we are nothing. You have invited us now to come. And we have came to your tabernacle this morning. Having recognized that you are the sin pardoning God. You are the one who can give strength over the sinful practices of life. So we ask the Holy Spirit, that you will indwell in our hearts this morning. Fill us to the overflowing. Remove anything that is unlike thee from our lives. Make us worthy to give you praise and honor and glory this morning. We pray for those who are on the verge of giving up. Oh God, recognize that sin has taken so much lives in this world. We long to see you. We long to be in a place where there be no more sin, no more temptation, no more trouble. So we ask that you cleanse us. You give us the strength that we need to live day by day. Remember those who are sick and afflicted this morning. We pray, Holy Father, that you visit with those who are at home in the hospital, that you touch them and you make them well according to your will. Oh God, what a God you are. 
It is so wonderful to serve you, to believe in you, and to trust you. And at this time, we pause to give those who have a burden, who want to talk to you, this is the moment. We thank you, God, for hearing our prayers this morning. We thank you for the answer that you will give to us. Help us to accept your divine will in our light. Remember, Sister McFarlane, your daughter, who we have sent this morning to blow the trumpet in Zion. We ask that you give us receptive heart and mind to listen to your voice. And we pray that we will be obedient to your divine will, that we leave here rejoice and empower her now, I pray, in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Hello to our women's ministries. Before I go on, I want to share an experience that I've done last Sunday. And I thought I made a little bit of make a difference to our neighbor. I called one day to my neighbor. I said, hello, how are you? I said, I'm fine. I said, it's been a while. We never get together. When are we going to do that? I told myself. And I said, Hmm, we'll see. Why don't we do some kind of barbecues? I said, ha, ah, that sounds like a good plan. I said, let's do it. So I checked all the weather. The weather was fine. I was thinking that was supposed to be this or tomorrow. But the weather is not cooperating at that time. I said, oh, this Sunday coming is supposed to be nice, so let's do it. I said, ah. Oh. So I was kind of excited. Same time, I'm like, hmm, I wonder how many people will show up. It's just, I invited all the neighbors around my, my community. And I, I told my husband didn't know. My, when he came home, I told him, I have a good plan. I don't know if you like it or not, but I'm going to do it anyway. I said, what about it? I said, we're having a barbecue. I said, good, I'm the cook. I said, that's even better. So anyway, I did. But today, I'm calling for the offering appeal is for women's ministry. Proverbs 31.8, it says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Women are especially designed by God to meet the needs of other women. Women's ministry is the best way to connect both church and unchurch women in our community to each other and to introduce them to Jesus Christ. As we hear more videos in a moment, let us learn more about our ministries and how we can impact our church and in our community in nadwn.org. Thank you for supporting women's ministries as we seek to encourage, equip, and challenge girls, teens, and women to grow deeply in God and serve Him uniquely with our gifts and talents. I would like to invite all the deacons to come forward. Shall we pray? Lord, we give you our hearts, we give you ourselves, and we give you these gifts. Thank you for this privilege. We love you and serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Where is your hope standing on? What keeps you going when you are overwhelmed by anguish and despair? As we do not control all aspects of our existence, we tend to trust in something or someone bigger than ourselves. One of our natural inclinations is to put our confidence in our accumulated resources. They are visible and measurable, leading us to think they are sure. However, according to Paul, it is safer to place our hope in the source of wealth than in wealth itself. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Mark from South China was deeply moved by a call for offering, and he gave 30% of his total savings as his offering. Soon afterward, he experienced a severe and unexpected financial crisis. His new business collapsed, and he fell into debt. During this time, he heard an appeal for a new church building that would cost 10 million Chinese yuan. Mark realized that it was a rare opportunity to advance God's mission in his province of more than 60 million people. Impressed by the Holy Spirit, he committed to give a special offering of 400,000 Chinese yuan. He had no idea where the money would come from. Then something amazing happened. The shareholder of his former architecture company invited him back to work. He accepted the offer and was soon promoted to executive officer and board director. Mark ended up contributing 1 million Chinese yuan to the church building project. Looking back at his life's experiences, he wrote, the grace of the Lord is like endless running water. Mark demonstrated trust by giving his fleeting resources to worship the God who richly provides for all. As you return your tithes and promise, regular and systematic offerings, follow Mark's example and make a statement about where your hope resides. May we put our desires last and God first. This is thankful. Don't worry. This is Jesus, hey who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Jesus did many amazing things. He taught everyone about God's love, healed people from their sickness, and even calmed storms. Shush, shush. One day, Jesus was speaking to thousands of people. Hey, Jesus! When someone asked him about money, he told them a story and tried to explain to the people that our treasure is not on earth, but in heaven. Then he turned to one of his disciples and said, That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food to eat or enough clothes to wear, for life is more than food and your body more than clothing. Uh, I guess. Look at the ravens. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns because God feeds them, and you are far more valuable to God than any birds. Uh, yeah, I think so. Do you think that by worrying about anything, you can add a single moment to your life? And if worry can't do a little thing like that, what's the use of worrying over bigger things? That's a good point. Look at all the lilies and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon, the great king of Israel, in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and thrown away tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. And don't worry about what to eat or what to drink. Hey, okay. Many people worry about these things, but God already knows what you need. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and he will give you everything you need. So don't be afraid, for it makes God happy to take care of you and give you his kingdom. So share what you have with others and give to those who need. There you go. Thank you. Sorry, hi. Then you'll be storing up treasure in heaven. And when your treasure is in heaven, it's gonna be safe. No thief can steal it. And no bug can destroy it. Man, whatever. Wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also.
Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Okay. Um, so this morning, we, the children's ministry department wanted to um, share some information about VBS. So excitedly, I'm excited. I hope you are. We will be having VBS this year in person here at church in person during the week of July 18th. So um, as we are starting to prepare for VBS, we are looking for volunteers to run the program and ensure that we have a very success, successful outreach. As you know, VBS is outreach, so we're trying to engage our communities and get the kids so that they can learn about Jesus and how much he loves us and teaches us not to worry about anything. So we are looking for volunteers. Some of the um, areas that we need volunteers for, so we do need small group leaders, opening and closing station leaders, song leaders, all, AKA rock stars, um, station leaders, prayer leaders, decorating team, photographers, AV, AV team, um, registration helpers, first aid providers, and follow-up leaders. So the list is long, but I know, actually, I'm very confident that the Holy Spirit is gonna move this congregation to support our VBS program this year. So. I'm not worried because we're going to have an awesome VBS because God is in charge and this is his plan and we are going to have a great outreach program for the community. So today, for those of you that are already impressed, as I'm very confident that lots of you are already impressed. So for those of you that are already impressed, if you do want to hear more about what the individual roles are, um, if you can meet me at the front of the church at the end of um, service today. I can share a little bit more about what these individual roles are, and then you can let me know your availability and your contact details, and we will get things moving. All right, so let us pray. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you that you have called us to be co-laborers with you. As we worship in your presence today, let your Holy Spirit continue to move us to do your work. All this we ask in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Oh, we do have a promo video on VBS, so you'll also get to see what this year's VBS program will be about. Welcome to Jasper Canyon, where every kid is treasured by God. Put on your hiking boots and your Rockhound t-shirt. All week, the kids will have fun being Rockhounds, and with the encouragement of Rocky the Rockhound, they will learn to dig that Jesus made them special, strong, and smart. They will also learn that we are all part of Jesus' family and that Jesus wants to live with us forever. Each day, a Bible story will reinforce the daily find. Kids will learn about Ruth, Solomon, Abigail, and Elijah, and how they each showed us how to live for Jesus. I think we just learned something new to make the world more beautiful. As kids learn about each Bible character, they will discover how they are treasured by God, just like the Bible heroes. Day at the dig site, kids enthusiastically sing meaningful songs and learn the daily find and bedrock verse. Oh, we finally made it to our dig site. I'm so excited. Uh, bring the equipment. I'll be very careful with it. <laughs> Dr. Soil and his assistant rockhounds join the kids at the dig site to share some intriguing, interesting, and funny facts about the rockhounding. A rock may not look very special when you look at it on the outside, but when you look underneath and remove all the dirt, it can be precious. Then it's time to head out to explore the beautiful Jasper Canyon. At Jasper Gemstone Mine, kids will experience the Bible story. Next, they're off to Artacraft Crafts, where all the rockhounds create some amazing crafts. A favorite stop is always the excavation post, where kids will learn to pray as a group and individually. 
To work off some energy, the testing pit is the next stop for some fun and challenging games. And of course, everyone will want to enjoy a refreshing, healthy snack at the Picnic Snack Shop. Kits will start shipping December 2021. For more information and to order your kit, visit AdventistVBS.org. Good morning, church. Um, please stand for the scripture reading for today. Today's scripture reading will be found in Psalms 23, verse 4, and it reads, Even though I walk through the dark, darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Today is a day to rejoice and give honor to God. As you see this lady on the screen, she'll be our main speaker for this afternoon, or I should say this morning. Dr. McFarlane, Dr. Shireen McFarlane, is a child of God willing to serve. In preparation for service, Dr. McFarlane obtains her master's degree in marriage and family therapy and her PhD in family studies from Loma Linda University. She's a registered psychotherapist and a registered marriage and family therapist. In service, Shireen from high school has shared the word of God and continues to do according to God's leading. Dr. McFarlane has served her community in various ways. She has conducted various seminars dealing with relationships, parenting, domestic violence, religion, and the family and other family life issues. She also had the opportunity to work with divorcing parents, teaching about the effects of divorce on the social, the emotional, and academic lives of their children. In 2007 and 2008, Shireen had a team of other professionals. They conducted crisis intervention training for the South Botswana Conference to support their development of a counseling center. She currently works at Catholic Family Service of Toronto, as a program manager over the Violence Against Women's program and currently teaches part-time at Wealth Humber University. She currently serves as a board member of the Toronto Adventist District School Board and is an executive committee member representing the Ontario Conference at North American Division Annual Meetings. Ladies and gentlemen, children, youths, the next voice you will hear is from Dr. Shireen McFarlane. Let's welcome her. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I see some smiles. I want smiles on all faces. Happy Sabbath, everyone. The sun is shining, and it's getting warmer and warmer each day. Isn't that exciting? Because um, God is good all the time, right? I'm just kind of warning, warming myself up while I try to warm you guys up. Are you guys warmed up? I just want to say uh, thank you for having me here. I am 
I'm blessed. I really enjoyed worship service this morning. I was like, hmm, maybe I should make my move out to Windsor to hang out with all you guys because it was such a warm uh, welcome this morning. Um, so thank you for having me this morning. Can you believe I still get nervous? <laughs> Just taking a breath here. I still get nervous, but it's all good. So today I'm going to speak to you on the secret about valleys. The secret about valleys. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, it is a privilege to be in your presence. Father God, thank you so much for making the opportunity to worship you and give you glory and just for you to spend time with us on this day. I pray, dear Lord, as we dive into your word that your Holy Spirit will speak to us, teach us, guide us, refresh us, and make us fit for a whole new week. We thank you for what you're about to do in your precious name I pray, amen. The secret about valleys. I wanna kind of reflect on my own experience. So after completing my PhD, you would figure I was on my highest point of education, for example. But over the next couple of years, it would seem that I fell into a valley. Why was I feeling so low? Why was I so discouraged? I had just completed school, I was working, things were going well, but I felt as though I was in a valley. Not sure what the direction, next direction I should take. There were more dark days than sunny days. And somehow, I feel like God had forgotten me. I was sitting in a valley. And in addition to that, I started to have health challenges, of which I'm still kind of working through. But I fell into a space of which I felt like God had forgotten me and no matter how much I had just accomplished, I was sitting in a valley. When I came across, I, I would like to say that the epiphany came to me while I was sitting in this valley wondering where I was going and what I was doing and how I was gonna get there. But it wasn't until maybe a, this year that I realized and I look back at Psalms 23, four, that there is a purpose in the valley. The question is, what role do valleys play in our lives? Because we definitely experience those valleys. I thought about Joseph. Do you remember Joseph? Joseph, the young man who had these dreams that he was going to save and his, his brothers were bowing down to him. Did you know that he ended up in jail for a while? He was in a valley. And the question is, how was this helpful to where he was going? I'm gonna let you sit and think about that. I'm not gonna tell you the answer. So I started to dig. I started to dig and guess what? I found some secrets. If we take the whole text, Psalms 23, Let's read it. We're pretty much familiar with it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Here it is. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup 
runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There is secrets in the valley. So let's take a closer look at Psalms 24. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I dug a little deeper. The first part of this text that I want to hone in on is walk through. The first two th words that pop out is walk through. Yea, they, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You know, it's interesting that as we think of the valley of the shadow of death, of which I will kind of, kind of describe to you later, that you would want to make a run through the valley. That you would want to hasten through the valley of the shadow of death. But the Bible says that, yea, they I walk through. There's no haste. The text didn't say to run or rush through, but walk. Entering the valley of the shadow of death, there should be a sense of urgency to get through. But you see, when we're walking through this time, the journey is intentional. Sometimes we have to walk through and take our time in that space absorbing the experience that is happening to us so that we can be prepared for the next. I'm building, stay with me. So the other piece of that is walking through is that he didn't take us around the valley. He takes us through the valley. So as we experience some of the most difficult, maybe trying, overwhelming times in our lives, we are not going to escape it. We're not going to walk around it. We're not going to go over it. We sometimes can't even dig underneath it. But the only way through the valley is through. We want to hide. We want to avoid the situation of our least desirable times in our life. But God is actually calling us to walk through. Yea, though I walk through the valley. The Lord is my shepherd. It started there, remember. So he is calling us to walk through our valleys. The other word that I want to kind of describe and paint a picture for you is the actual valley. You see, valleys are created by water erosion from uh, mountains. So over years, water, the gush of water, eventually rolls the side of mountains and creates a valley. And over time, these valleys often take a U shape or a V shape. And so there's a gap that goes right through the mountain or hill. And so sometimes the steeper the mountain, the deeper the valley. I'm going to let that sit in your head for a second. The steeper the mountain, the deeper the valley. Which means that there is usually <clears throat> lower ground in, in a mountain. But what people don't really recognize when they think about valleys and the fact that they seem so ominous and scary, is that, have you ever considered that they're actually protection from fierce winds and storms? Geographically, when you think about how a valley is situated, when a storm comes across, that valley is protected because of the high walls, because of the steep high mountain sides. 
the, the valley does not experience the full force of storms. Ha. Huh. Ha. Huh. So when you think about it, valleys are about protection. It seems that David in this Psalms might have been referring to a wadi kelt, and I'm not very good at Hebrew or Greek, so just stay with me, which is near somewhere near the Jordan. <clears throat> and the wadi means valley, and kelt means darkness or refers to darkness. And it, as the Bible suggests, it means a shadow of death. The valley, as we have in our minds, often we see a narrow, dark place um, that is treacherous or dangerous. In actual my research, in some of these valleys, these were where children may have been sacrificed. On the way to the cross, Jesus walked through a valley. So you can imagine why when we think about valleys, our thought is about despair and discouragement, a rough time in our life of not being able to make it through, a difficult portion in our journey we often consider a valley, a low spot on our way to our destination. But I have, a, I have some good news to tell you, that there are some secrets in the valley. The other word that I want to spend some time kind of describing to you is shadow, okay? Shadow of valley of death. We read that in, in verse 4. Um, the valley is described with a shadow, and when we think of a shadow, a shadow is a dark area actually on a bright surface. So a shadow is formed when something is blocking the light, okay? When the sun is directly above, as we know at noonday, there are no shadows because it's nothing blocking its pathway. So shadows Hear this, shadows don't exist without light. I'm going to say that again. Shadows don't exist without light. So even dark shadows can disappear. So I'm going to let those little descriptions sit with you because that is where I found the secrets. It makes sense to uh, equate this part of our journey as feeling like death is imminent. It, it makes sense that when you think about the shadow of the valley of death, that God has maybe forgotten you or forsaken you in this place, or that darkness is all about you. But I want to let you know that I found some secrets in the valley. Secret number one, shadows are temporary. That's exciting. We become concerned with the shadow of death, but when we understand the nature of shadows, they are only temporary. The light is still there because on the edges of the shadow, light exists. Shadows are temporary. Only when something is blocking the sun is when we get a shadow, which means the light hasn't gone anywhere. Ha! Huh. In the midst of the shadow, the light is still there. So what are we allowing to block the sun from shining on us? Sometimes it's fear. Sometimes it's disobedience to his will. Sometimes it's negative or destructive people or thoughts that we carry around in our lives. 
Sometimes it's trauma. Sometimes it's enemies. But they're only an object because the light is still present. Shadows are temporary. You see, sometimes a shadow is so overwhelming that depth, se death seems like the only outcome. I want to bring forth David, who we've walked through his journey, and he has described his despair on numerous occasions. Psalms 22, 1, he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from my words, from my groaning, oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, am I not silent? Despair and discouragement can take us over. We can feel overwhelmed. Job is, was overcome by his situation that he curses the day that he was born. Job 3, 5, my darkness and shadow of death claim it. May a cloud of set it. May the darkness, um, blackness of the day terrify it. I'm not trying to tell you that your experience or your valleys don't look scary or shadowy, but I want to let you know that the light is still there and shadows are just temporary. Remember that at the beginning of this, you are only walking through the valley of the shadow of death because the sun is present and the sun is coming in on all sides. So look to the sun because you're only walking through. In our valleys, we have to be mindful of what is getting between us and the Son of God. That is making us feel like we can't make it through. You see, let's remove the object and let the sun shine directly on us. You see, even if you can't move it, at some point, huh, at some point in the day is noon and the sun shines directly on you. Shadows are only temporary. In the time of the shadow, enemies become footstools. In time of the shadow of bills, tuitions get paid. In the time of shadows of despair, you are comforted. In the time of shadow of fear, there comes courage. Shadows are only temporary. The second secret I found was that um, <clears throat> valleys are actually there for protection. So as I was describing earlier in regards to the uh, look in the geographical makeup of a valley, valleys are often surrounded by mountains or, or mountain walls. So storms that are in the path of, that, of the valley often become reduced or are even dispersed because they don't necessarily reach in full force to the valley. We're often afraid of being uh, in the valley because the walls are grand and scary and big. Our problems seem insurmountable that there's no way out or that we're defeated. But I want to let you know that those are there for your protection. Let's go to the story of Elijah. <clears throat> Elijah in, in 1 Kings 17, 1 to 6. And Elijah, Elijah the Tishrite, the inhabitants of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord God lives, Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew or rain these years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, get away from here and turn eastward and hide in the brook or the valley of Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And it will be that you will drink from the brook and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of God, for he went and stayed in the brook or valley which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank 
from the brook. I'm letting you know that valleys are there for your protection. God sent Elijah to the valley. See, you, I want you to see what's happening. Famine is coming to Israel. His life was threatened. There were a few allies that he had. And guess where God sends him? To the valley. In the midst of the most severe storms, in the midst of the hottest point of the battle, God moves us to the valleys to protect us. Isn't that exciting? As children of God, we may encounter obstacles and trials that challenge us, but doesn't necessarily take us out, but through. You see, when we speak truth like Elijah did, we might become isolated. When we take on the righteousness of Christ, we might become targets. When we choose to stand against our enemies, uh, our enemies will want us to fall. So sometimes in the midst of the battle, our valleys become shelter from the storm. So when we thought those mountains or hill walls were there to discourage us, we learn, in fact, that they are there to protect us. The other interesting uh, part of this protection, he not only wants to protect us, he wants to restore us. It seems very odd that restoration might come from a valley experience. But if you go back to Psalms uh, 23, 1 to 3, it says, he leads us, guides us beside the still waters. He restores our soul. He takes you out of the heat of the battle in the midst of the storm sometimes to teach us, to slow us down, to reflect on lessons, to be fed, to prepare us for the next part of the journey. I, I'm going to get there, but I'm just so excited to reach there because when we think about it, the famine was coming, and he took Elijah from the midst of that into the valley, and guess what? He was fed. While everything else was going on around him, Elijah was fed with bread and water in the valley. He takes us there to protect us, to restore us, to build us. We're so used to running and fighting, doing um, that often the experience of the valley seems like a defeat, seems like loneliness. It, it seems like we're at a low. But let's think about the valley as an opportunity to rebuild, to be nurtured, to be healed, a time to slow down and listen. What does God have for you in the valley? Slow down. What does he have in you, the valley for you to hear? What does he have in the valley for you to heal from? While you're resting uh, in the valley, it's protection from the darts of the devil, from burnout, from draining people, from death. You see, Elijah was taken to the valley while he was being chased. He was being protected from all the people who were looking for him in the valley. While you're in your valley, you thought the valley was going to lead you to death. The valley is leading you to life. Secret number three. <clears throat> uh, there is usually water in the valley. Right? There's, when you go to a valley, there's a, maybe a small stream or a river. And the way in which the valley is created is actually from water eroding 
the mountain. So there's usually water in the valley. So our typical understanding is that there is a dry, a valley is a dry and, and desolate place where we tend to lose things or uh, there's a drought or brokenness or, or despair. But yet there is water in the valley. Elijah was sent to the valley uh, in verses three and four. And the word came to him saying, get away from there and turn eastward and hide in the brook of Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And it will be there, drink for the brook, for I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. I want to uh, suggest to you that um, sometimes we don't even know where our salvation and freedom is going to come. This was a faith-building exercise. God, Elijah had to trust God um, to provide for him in the valley. You see, he had just pronounced a famine and a drought. But when we're connected to God, our valley experiences is where we're provided for. What is interesting, he said that he would command the ravens to feed you. So it's like, okay, what's up with these ravens, right? Ravens, like birds of the air going to come and feed Elijah? I did some research about ravens because I was like, who are these birds? Ravens are actually one of the most intelligent birds around. They are scavengers and eat everything. They can imitate human speech. Huh. They're skillful hunters. And interestingly, when you see them represented or analogies, they're often associated with death. Ravens. He commanded the ravens to come and feed Elijah. Let me tell you that God can use anything and anyone and anything to provide for you. Ravens? That means the scavengers were taking their own food and bringing Elijah food. Come on. Ravens? They could have uh, killed him or eaten him, but God sent ravens. So let me tell you something about God. You see, we want to associate everything with death, but sometimes God uses it for our protection and restoration. He represents the scavenger uh, of the raven was associated with death, but now it represents provision and sustenance. In our uh, valley experience, our sustenance and provision will come from places we don't expect or may have misunderstood. In your valley, you didn't have tuition, yet it was paid and you graduated. You needed a job and you got an interview from somewhere you didn't apply. You were discouraged and you received encouragement from a simple song. You needed money and found it just lying on the sidewalk. God can provide for you in ways you can't even think about. From people you won't even expect. God is working with us even in our valleys. There is always water in the valley. So when you're in your valley, remember that what seems like death restores. What seems like death provides. What seems like death quenches and thirsts when you move with God through the valley. I was just thinking about this and when we think about valleys, this just came to me, when we think about valleys and we think about how it means death and, you know, discouragement, maybe it's that way because there's some things that need to die in us. 
Sometimes he takes us to the valley so that he can get rid of stuff. And that's what dies. But you are restored. You are protected. The fact is when God moves us to the valley, he is our protector, our bread, and our water. Our valley experience is different from those who don't have God. He feeds and restores your soul. In the valley, God provides. Secret number four. In the valley, God is there with you. He is there with you. Psalms 23, the verse, verse 4. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and your staff, they comfort me. Our initial thought about going through a valley experience is that we are alone in the valley. That because of the darkness and the shadows, there's no one there with us. And we look at the mountain walls and we think we are separated from God and everyone else. So you can see why the text can feel as though the sun in a narrow valley doesn't catch uh, that area much or that it can be narrow and very difficult to maneuver when you're in the valley. But God is with us. You see, I want to remind you of, I go back to this, Joseph is actually my favorite story because it has so many exciting pieces. But let's, let's talk about Joseph, uh, 39, 21, verses 23. He was sitting in the jail, I can't even remember how long. And in fact, it was uh, 13 years from when he had the dreams to the point of where he reached uh, that he was in the valley. But you see, in that verse, he says that God was with him. If you read it there, he was with them and showed him mercy in the jail. Come on, guys. This remem remind me of Daniel in the lion's den. Ha! Huh. About to face death of these li hungry lions. But God was in there in the den and shut the lion's mouth. This reminds me of the disciples in the boat. You remember that story? In the midst of the storm, and they were scared and didn't know what to do with themselves. And guess where Jesus was? Right in the midst of the boat. God is with us. So the secret of this valley is that you are not alone in your valley. God will not send you where he's not going with you. God is with us in the valley. So the other piece of that is sometimes, even though we might cognitively think that God is there or may not be there, you see it says, thy rod and thy staff are with me. Now, the interesting with a shepherd and his rod and the staff, there are tools for him to use to guide the sheep, to make sure that they don't kind of go off in one direction. Sometimes he has to tap them and keep them in, direct, in the place. Sometimes the valley is so narrow, they have to go through it in a line, right? So those sheep in front need to know that the staff is there. They can see the staff. They can't see the shepherd. But they can see the staff or the rod to guide them through. So the rod and a staff become an extension of his arm. So he helps to use and guides. And so in the same way, uh, when we're going through difficult times, when it seems so dark and narrow, God is using uh, his rod and his staff to protect us and guide us and move us through the valley. 
You see the rod and the staff also is there as uh, a potential weapon to fight off those that might want to eat the sheep, right? And so God uses that, again, to protect us and shield us from the enemy. Huh. God is with us in the valley. Since it's narrow, his presence may, we may not always see him, but we can feel him. We can experience him. In our valley experience, we are assured of the sound of his voice. We are comforted by the nudging of the Holy Spirit. We are strengthened even when we're corrected to go in the right path. God is with us in the valley. We want to get upset with him when we're in the valley and he's guiding and correcting and leading and instructing. But it is these actions that lead us to feel comforted because he is taking us through the valley. So that means when you are convicted, it is God guiding you through. When you are humbled, it is God molding you through. When you are pruned, it is God shaping you through. When you are feeling hot, it is because God is refining you. And he does this all in the valley. So in the valley, it is time that we listen that we reflect, that we pay attention and, and stay tuned because God is there right beside you, walking with you through the valley. You know, it is important for us to understand that uh, we will all experience valleys. Um, and most recently, it was mentioned today that even the last two years, COVID pushed us into a, a situation where a lot of us went into a valley experience. Um, we've experienced shadows of the valley because we've experienced anxiety or depression or mental uh, is illnesses that raise their heads or uh, violence in families, challenges in our relationships uh, through COVID, uh, challenges with employment, maybe decreased hours, loss of job, financial stress. But I want to let you know that no matter what you go through and no matter what your valley may look like, shadows are temporary. No matter what it seems like, valleys are there for your protection. No matter how hard it gets or how desperate it looks, there is water and restoration and provision in the valley. And as you're sitting in this valley, and hopefully we're coming out of this valley, we have to remember that God is with us in the valley. So when God is a shepherd of your life, death is only a shadow and its existence is temporary because the son of God dispels all darkness. When God is the shepherd of your life, the mountain walls become your shield and reduce the impact of the storm in your life. When God is the shepherd of your life, all your needs are provided for in ways you never expected. When God is the shepherd of your life, he will always give you evidence that he is present to guide, to lead, to instruct, to protect, and comfort you through the valley. So I challenge you today to look at your valleys differently. Pay attention to God's presence and not his absence. Not everything in the valley represents, that represents death means death. It could mean life. 
And what you think is there could harm you could be very well there to preserve you. I have a song. Um, I don't know if you guys have it up there. It's uh, God is Good by um, Jonathan McReynolds. And I'm just going to ha have them play it um, because it's very short. But it captures the whole idea that even in the valley, God is good. May your struggles keep you near the cross. And may your troubles show that you need God. And may your battles in the way they should. And may your bad days Prove that God is good. And may your whole life prove that God is good. See, may your struggles keep you near the cross. And may your trust. Our struggles sometimes that keep us near Christ. It is our troubles that we need God in the valleys. It's our battles that we want them to end the way they should just because we know that our whole life that God is good. Let your whole life prove that God is good. Amen. I just want to encourage you that even one of my favorite songs, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. That means that in the good times and in the bad times, I am praising God because God is good. In the valley, I know that I need him even more to take me through because he's so good. And if you want to just stand and say, Lord, I need you. I need you in the valley. I need you through my battle. I know that you have me here to protect me, to restore me, to build me. Just stand and say, God, you are so good. And thank you so much for taking me through this valley. I am just going to take your uh, standing and, and commitment to God and just show that he has got your back. He is good, and he is taking you through this valley. Gracious and loving God, we thank you so much that there are secrets in the valley. We thank you, God, that even at our lowest point, we see how you are working it all for our good. And Father God, we don't know how long we'll be there. We don't know what the, the, the uh, destination might be. But because you are our good shepherd, you will take us through. So Father God, help us to commit to holding on to your changing hand as you take us through the valley. In your precious name I pray, amen. We want to thank Dr. Mark Farland. Praise the Lord for Amen. that message. Amen? Amen. Amen. There are secrets in the valley. Amen? Amen. 
Amen. We just want to remind everyone about this afternoon. Right after this, we do have a potluck. And also our youth. She will be um, speaking to everyone, but mainly our youth, about those valleys. This afternoon at 2.30. So don't go anywhere. My youths that are up on the stage in the audience, please stay back so that we can learn more about the valleys. Let's sing. Let's all stand, please.
pray. Our gracious Father in heaven, indeed, how great thou art. We thank you for blessing us with your special presence. And as your sons and daughters are here to worship you in the beauty of your holiness. We thank you for the encouraging morning message that we shall not fear even if we are walking to the shadow of the valley of death. Amen. For you are there with us. You are mighty, almighty shepherd. Your rod and your staff indeed comfort us. Now to our beloved congregation, may our God of hope bless you, be with you, fill you with all joy and peace, and also that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.